speaker is, and there's a way to get to the... Hit escape. Cool. Now go to the bottom there. Yeah. There you are. Okay. And Chris, I'll let you make this how you want to be. Okay. I want to introduce, I'm sorry, <laughs> technically challenged up front. Um, I want to introduce Dr. Christine Courtois, who, again, is also someone who is very well known in the trauma field and very active in APA and in specifically in Division 56, Division of Trauma Psychology. Um, she is the director of Christine Courtois and, As and Associates, um, a newly expanded and very exciting trauma practice in Washington, D.C., offering trauma treatment, life transitions, and wellness. She's also the author of several books on trauma, including Healing the Incest Wound. Um, she's written many chapters, done hundreds of presentations, very um, active in the professional education and training in the professional co org um, community for trauma therapists and for psychologists. And as just we are all really lucky to have Chris working on our behalf, Dr. Chris Bourgeois. lovely introduction. I also have to say I have terrible hot flashes, so I'm going to be putting this on and off the whole time. <laughs> Not to distract you, just because my temperature will shift um, in various kinds of ways. Um, I'm delighted to be here this morning and to talk about this topic. This has been a very, <coughs> excuse me, a very rich uh, opportunity, no pun intended, rich opportunity for us to uh, collaborate on a topic that's been of interest to all of us and one that we don't think um, gets discussed enough, especially in work with um, the, this population. The three of us do, tend to do long-term or longer-term depth work and relational-based work with, as Lori said, folks who have all kinds of attachment disturbances and um, have complex traumatic stress reactions, which really involves their ability to re relate to others in their developmental capacities. So this is um, something that we see as very important. And as Lori emphasized, and the literature emphasizes, that termination should be seen as part of the treatment and should be taken into account almost from the start. And um, I'd like to emphasize also what Lori said, saying it a little bit different way. Don't ever, ever, ever say, I will never leave you. Um, therapy, like life, is very conditional. It's very uncertain. And many of us made and make the mistake, especially as we're driven by our own counter-transference to rescue these patients who may have been parentless, who may have had no upbringing, who may attach and glom onto us, and who may see us as you know, the ultimate and the ultimate rescuer. Um, it's really important that we not tell them that we're, we will never leave them. Um, but that this is a very conditional relationship, and life is very conditional, and that an ending is going to be a very important, important part of treatment and something that is incorporated into the treatment. Now, it also depends on your treatment setting. Um, I run an inpatient unit, and we would start planning for discharge on the day of admission. Um, so, <laughs> You know, it's really going to depend on your setting, your style, the type of therapy. So there'll be wide variations. <clears throat> I love the word termination. <laughs> you know, and I just wanted to make the point that we use it clinically. You know, when we say it to people, or the first time we say it to a client, they may go, huh? <laughs> what are you talking about? You're going to terminate me? Um, I, I think we have to realize that, you know, we're using a clinical definition to explain it, that what we really mean is we're talking about when therapy comes to uh, a conclusion or an end. And that, you know, again, clients may take this in a, in a very different way, and some endings are much more permanent than others, so um, define your terms. Now, I'm sorry this is pro projecting a sort of green. I don't know what now. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Voice control. Yeah. Okay. No, it's, yeah, it's the computer. What? It goes with your screen. Thank you. Okay, it goes with my shot. Uh, okay. 
Um, I also want to say that, you know, it's easy for us to consider termination or the ending as something negative when, in fact, it can be the conclusion. And again, if you see it as part of the process, a very natural conclusion to the work that you've done. And in fact, this new research that really stresses, and this is not just from positive psychology, but it certainly goes along with it, that stresses that it can be a sign of success, you know. We want to kick our heels up when the, the client says, you saved my life, or my life has opened up, and this has been the most wonderful experience I've ever had, or, or you've gotten me through, or we've gotten us through, gotten me through, um, and I've graduated, or I've launched into my life. I talk to cl clients about this is like, in, in especially in long term when we're doing developmental work, that this is like a, a different kind of upbringing. And then in a healthy family, hopefully you're going to be launched. There's going to be um, separation and individuation. And that's also part of what we're aiming towards, a healthy, happy, and productive life for you. And, you know, that you can use this as your launching pad or your base and you learn important skills here um, or important life issues or you resolve important issues. So. Let's think about it as the, the growth potential and, and the positive and also the wrap-up to uh, what's very often successful work. Interestingly, for us who are so oriented towards um, relational therapy, um, also the Therapeutic Alliance, once the alliance is formed, it seems to reduce the tendency towards premature termination. That's pretty understandable. And it tends to increase the pop probability of mutual and satisfactory endings. And the implication here is to focus on positive feelings and not just the emotionally painful aspects. You know, we, we tend to, to only think about it in terms of loss and grief and, and bringing up previous losses when in fact there's a counterbalance to that that should be looked at. And uh, as Lori so aptly put it, that we use the relationship to support the ending and to, to be able to feel mutual satisfaction in the case of a successful therapy that's coming to a mutual, mutually determined ending. Obviously, termination and how it goes and um, the time you have is influenced by the type of treatment and the treatment contract. So what Laura just spoke of is a long-term open-ended treatment and it's gonna be very different with solution-focused or CBT or time-limited. Um, and as well as different orientations may call for different endings, where a psychoanalytic orientation may have a lot more in-depth analysis of some of the issues and the grief and the re, um, you know, resolving the transference and the counter-transference. Um, and, and a little interesting research study that I just um, found in doing my research is that a, a sample of 84 psychodynamic clients in treatment for average, on an average of two years, 60% were not satisfied with the timing of the termination. I thought this was interesting because 40% of them said therapy ended too soon, and 23% said that it lasted too long. <laughs> so, however, they had been, uh, the majority had been involved in initiating their termination, and I think this speaks to the need to try to discuss why is it time to terminate? Why are you determining that? Are there other factors? Is there other need for therapy? Um, either with me or with someone else. Now, as Lori also um, suggested, there are different types and reasons and scenarios. First of all, it can be very planful, as we just heard. When Lori first said to me, 18 months, I said, no, no, no. <laughs> Six months at the max. That was my, I think, <laughs> needing to protect Lori. Um, when in fact, 18 months worked very well for her, and we need to listen to that. My preference, if I were to close my practice tomorrow, would probably, and planfully, would probably be six months or four months. Um, it would be hard for me to do the 18 months. So really, um, therapist preference plays in there, as well as looking at the best interest of the client. And the welfare of the client, as we look at risk management and ethics, the welfare of the client is really what needs to be considered in all of these dimensions, and non-malfeasance that we are not doing anything that um, is deliberately harmful to the clients. Uh, a second category is when an ending is very sudden versus gradual or extended. 
When is therapist initiated? When is client initiated? When it's mutual? And there are times when it's very situational. And um, we'll talk a little bit about each of these. And however it happens, whenever it happens, whatever the type it is, it often involves complicated clinical risk management and ethical uh, issues that vary by situation. Sometimes you're going to need to um, consult and don't jump out of your seats an attorney. <laughs> okay? And sometimes you're going to have to consult an ethicist. Sometimes you consult with your colleagues. Sometimes you do all three. However, I warn you, having had this experience, that sometimes legal and ethics don't go. Um, and then you're caught between, you know, well, what's the right thing to do? And how do I do it? And in the rest of my presentation, I'd like to give you some clinical vignettes. They're real life vignettes from my career to illustrate some of these different endings and some of the issues that did emerge and some of the things to think about. First of all, I work in consultation with a variety of therapists. We're going to first talk about termination by the therapist. And um, listening to them, doing therapy with a particular patient with whom they've had great difficulty sounds like torture. And therapists very often don't realize they have the right to end a treatment, and they can make that decision. So that may not be the thing that you want to do the most, but it may be necessitated by a situation or how the therapist is responding to, to a situation. So the first thing that I think it's important to realize is we do have the right to end treatment. Now, in terms of ethics, we do not have the right to abandon a client. And we do not have the right to hand the client um, a boatload of our hostile feelings and to act out our hostile feelings. Um, I used to be the clinical director of an inpatient unit, and I can't tell you how many times I sat with a patient whose therapist had said, I will never leave you. And then the therapy got more and more and more difficult, partially because the therapist had given too much and made that statement. And the, the patients were legitimately in that statement asking for too much. And um, they got dumped. And they used to get dumped in our inpatient unit, which is probably the best place to dump someone if you're going to, because at least there's a support system. But I would sit with patients who would cry. He, she said they would never leave me. For attachment-disturbed folks and disorganized attachment, this is terrible when we're talking about welfare of the clients, even if it's the most difficult client in the world. Their welfare we have a fiduciary and an ethics responsibility to their welfare, and this is not a way to end their treatment. And I think we've all been there. Um, I want to say that I'm not sitting here preaching not having been there. I have stopped therapies, and in the past, without being as thoughtful as I am today, I've stopped them much too abruptly, without enough attention. Um, but I've also seen the damage done um, sitting on the inpatient perspective. Um, an inpatient setting. Now, there are a variety of factors that could lead a therapist to um, choose to um, end a therapy, and I just listed some of them here. It could be many, many more. It could be situational, very, very individualized. The first, of course, is non effectiveness of the treatment. As we review those voluminous records that Lori talked about, and as we review the treatment, is it effective? We have an ethical mandate to periodically look at that. Is the client making strides? Is the client compliant with the treatment plan and willing to do what is needed? Is the client motivated? Are they willing to go along with what has been um, decided? Are they engaged in an ongoing way in therapy interfering behavior? And I love the Linehanian term. Um, are they late? Are they never there? They never do their homework. They never do this. They never do that. Currently, I have a client who I'm not considering termination, but if she continues in this vein, I will consider it. Um, I have in my, con my treatment contract a, um, a clause that says, no unplanned disclosures, confrontations, or contacts with alleged perpetrators, because unplanned and unprepared is dangerous for the client and for me. And last week, this woman wrote an extensive email to an alleged perpetrator and pressed push. 
and then told me after the fact and was outraged when I said this is in contradiction and I can't help you prepare for this. You tell me after you've done it, you've done it impulsively, and it's the same week, by the way, that you're stopping your medication and have become impulsive as a result of that, <laughs> okay? Um, this is something that I'm going to track, that if she continues this, we're going to have some discussions about whether she can stay in therapy with me. So this is a termination. I'm going to invite her to look at the conditionality of treatment and this condition in particular and working together, not working, you know, off base. Um, the degree of risk presented by the client. How often have I seen people from an inpatient perspective um, send clients packing to the inpatient ward um, if they cut, if they were suicidal, um, on the, and that's one side. The other side is um, client therapists who tolerate way, way, way too much and too much danger and too much risk and may come up short when they get a consultation and decide at that point, oh my God, I can't do this and I have to stop. Um, another is threat of or initiation of litigation. And I read a very interesting article about doctors um, that do a doctor was saying, if a patient threatens a medical doctor with litigation, should you continue to treat? Well, I don't think it's any different for us. Um, should we continue to treat? Or if there's actual litigation or actual board action, the hospital I worked at, as soon as somebody made a threat, um, or in fact initiated litigation, they were no longer allowed to admit to that hospital, which makes sense to me because there's a real dual um, issue going on um, and a threat. Um, so again, um, actions against licenses or boards would, would be the same thing. Um, threats of or actual violence towards self or others, including the therapist, um, stalking or any other major intrusion. And let me say that there are opportunities for major intrusions now that they were not before. The web is great for lots of things. But not so great when um, a patient goes looking for your health status or goes looking for your personal history or intrudes into your life in uncomfortable kinds of ways. So that may be uh, a reason for stopping. Obviously, some of the standard ones, non-attendance, chronic lateness, that kind of thing, non-payment. And of course, we all stay on top of that, right? Um, but those are all reasons that the therapist can initiate. Therapist factors might be the, the therapist kind of transference, that the therapist may have given too much at the office, promised too much, can't maintain. Um, I just, one of my clinical vignettes is just working with um, a therapist in my long-term consultation group who came in and said to us plainly, I can no longer stand this client. My life is in disarray at home because of this client. I've treated her for years. I think I've given her good treatment. I've given her every chance, and I don't want to continue to treat her. But she trusts me. Now, I also had had this patient in our day hospital, and I knew the patient. The patient had a hospital approach to anybody and everybody, including this therapist, and it never changed. She had gotten extensive feedback. She had gotten extensive therapy, and it was the same. And so what we did in that consultation group is work with the therapist to, first of all, decide that she was going to terminate, and then decide how to do it in the best possible way to create the least distress, and it was very distressing to this client, the least amount of distress, the greatest amount of clarity, and to provide something positive in referrals. And it took us about six months in this group. She had to have, the therapist had to have extensive discussion because despite all that she had given, she still was guilty. And she, she also was fearful. She knew this, this patient was going to lead with her rage. And she was absolutely right. And so we set up a, a game plan for how to do it. Um, but I think, you know, I want to say to you when you say, my whole life is upside down because of one client. Okay, there's something wrong <laughs> and something that needs to be looked at about that. So there may be other things that, like Lori presented. Um, you may change your specialization, change your focus, close your practice, 
There may be illness, it may be yours or other family matters. Um, there are myriad reasons that a therapist may um, call a termination. And then in terms of both factors, there may be a mismatch or a disagreement over the course of therapy or the effectiveness of therapy may unfortunately involve finances and insurance. So there's a variety of reasons. I think a foundational principle is termination must again be done with great sensitivity and thoughtfulness and with regard to the client's well-being. It's important not to abandon the client. I mean, this is where one of the major areas of ethics complaints. And if you look at risk management, if you just drop a client and also if you do it with great hostility, and you haven't processed your feelings about that particular client, um, you're at risk because those are the type of clients, AKA borderline type clients, that's how you read it in the literature, who are likely to come back and file a board complaint or to do something against the therapist. And legitimately, if you just drop them and you drop them hostily, and I can give you a really good example of that, recently a person who was entered the hospital, her therapist called the hospital and said, I will have nothing more to do with her, period. Okay? When we tried to negotiate that and have three-way conversation with that therapist, at least for some closure, the therapist refused. I can't stand this, ther this patient. She was suicidal. She's in the hospital. And a board complaint was made against that therapist for abandonment and her hostility, this patient had a long history of having been abandoned and this one was unnecessary the way it was and the hostility really generated a lot of damage. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, um, the, the therapist really needs to think about that therapy may need to continue for a bit of time until another referral is located and that concerns welfare also. And that can be very difficult for the patient who, for the therapist who's enraged or who has very other strong feelings, like, I feel like a hostage. <laughs> That's a strong feeling. Um, or I'm in fear of this patient. I mean, I think if there's an actual safety issue, that, that those are very often legitimate grounds to stop immediately. But the therapist needs to consult with others, get support, especially if you're in the kind of circumstance where you have to go into an extended um, position. And as Lori suggested, everything that Lori suggested is what's suggested here, that you communicate with the client about reasons that the therapist has chosen to end. Um, you do it with as much clarity as possible. You do it with a time frame in place that suits the therapist and the client. Um, that you give referrals and then it's recommended that it be followed up with a letter, registered letter, return receipt requested. If the client refuses to accept that letter, which I've seen, you take the letter back and you put it in your file. The client has refused contact from the therapist. Um, so that it's very clearly demarcated. But the more you can write about your justification for an ending, um, and with clarity, the better. Now, obviously, if the, the patient's not in agreement, you've got a different situation and a more, more adversarial situation than what Lori was um, describing. Um, I'm not going to have time for my clinical vignettes except to just give you some highlights, but termination by the therapist can also occur with these other dimensions, and I'll give you um, just some focus on this. Unplanned and sudden, I had a therapist die in my office of a cerebral aneurysm, okay? And I had to pick up the practice and her practice and her patients and inform them and care for them. Another situation we had recently in Washington, D.C. is a therapist suicided, okay? Another situation that's not as sudden but close is a therapist found out after having some abdominal pain that, um, she had incurable cancer and was given maybe a month to live. Um, so those are very sudden endings. Um, unplanned and more gradual, maybe a therapist's illness, um, something that is maybe requires surgery and being out for a while or may require the closing of practice and maybe 
more gradual. And then um, planned and time limited, as I just mentioned, the scenario that the therapist ends the therapy for a variety of reasons would be a more planful kind of thing. Now, when it's unplanned and sudden like this, um, in the case of therapist death, a professional will is something that you want to have in your cabinet and someone close to you should have a copy of it. Lori just sent me a copy of hers. I just updated mine as I'm expanding my practice. It says where you find my records, who my clients are, what my, where you find my schedule, how you notify people in the event of my sudden demise. Now, none of us like to think about that, but, um, and we all have strong defenses about that. However, especially in private practice, and especially in solo practice, this is something that is very, very important to have. So a professional will, you can find information about this on, online through Ken Pope's website. Um, professional will details all of these kinds of things and how you would handle a sudden death situation. I told you I had a, a therapist in my practice die. She had 18 patients. She had no professional will, but it was my practice. I had access to her schedule book because it was sitting on my desk open at the time that she suffered her aneurysm. Um, what was really helpful to me was a colleague in the community said, Chris, I will be there with you every step of the way. She came to my office as I had to face the open schedule book. She was with me as I started calling patients, and I found calling patients personally very, very painful to call them and say, your therapist unfortunately just died. So what I did instead was I met with every patient during the course of that week, and on her scheduled appointment time to inform them personally. So this was spontaneous. You can't plan for any of this. You know, but again, you have to really stress the welfare of the client. And in this case, this is my own welfare and my own feelings as well. Um, okay, other catastrophic <laughs> illness. Okay. I have um, more to go, so I'm going to not take questions at this point. We'll have time later. I have another five minutes or so, though. Again, um, I really want to stress this idea of having a professional will. Um, and um, when it's um, a therapist, for example, has a catastrophic illness and has to stop even for a while, this gives, um, you know, and with medical advances, you don't know. I have a friend who um, called me one day, a consultee. She was frantic the first time she called me. And I, we missed each other because she was at the hospital. She called me the next day, she was more frantic. We missed each other because she was at the hospital. I started to get you know, the idea that there was something terribly wrong. She called me the third day and she said, Chris, this time it's not about the client, it's about me. I have to talk to you. Every, she had gotten diagnosed with breast cancer on day one. On day two, she had found out that she couldn't have mastectomies because it was systemic. On day three, she found out that it was in her bones and in her organs. And on day four, she found out, however, that there was a treatment that was going to be extremely lengthy and extremely painful, but that might save her life. And she was opting for that because she had two young kids, but she also had a full practice. Okay. Now, the miracle part of the story is this woman went through this excruciating treatment and has come back and has been able to resume practice. But in between, it was a sudden ending and a sudden separation from all of her clients and a need to inform them to a certain degree. Um, so the issue of this kind of termination also involves disclosure by the client, by the therapist. Um, if, and the question is, in whose welfare is it? Does the client, does the therapist disclose if they don't have to? If it's not going to show, do you disclose? If you lose all your hair and you lose half your body weight, wouldn't it be better to disclose? <laughs> um, you know, and I've seen therapists who look like walking ghosts who because of their therapeutic orientation or their own denial have not said anything. I've also seen the other extreme. We had somebody in our community who had her patients nursing her as she died. Not a good way to do termination. <laughs> um, 
there's a literature about the um, the ill and dying therapist that really talks about if you disclose um, that it should be, and there's a debate, do you disclose or do you not? But again, whose welfare is it for? And for some, on the, on the pro side, they're saying if you disclose and you do it well and factually, you can really be helpful to clients about dealing with their own vulnerabilities and their own mortality. And you provide a model for them as to how you're dealing with yourself and dealing with them. Um, on the other hand, uh, you can tell them way too much and you can go way overboard to the point of having them nurse you as you're dying. Um, so, you know, it's staying in between and it's, it's being um, knowledgeable about um, how and when and uh, how much you tell individuals. And along with that, what's in the literature is be careful about um, that clients need referrals or may need a lot of support in the interim um, while treatment is ongoing. And some therapists um, have, have um, been so concerned with their own illness that they sort of forget about those dimensions. Um, this has to do with planned and time limited again um, that the therapist decides um, to stop I would in the interest of time what I would say here is what I explained in my consultation with this woman who wanted to stop that it be planful, it be mindful it be clear, it have timetables and sometimes just putting it out there will allow negotiation with the client so if you put out, you know, your intention and your reasons and the client comes back and says, oh my God, I didn't realize this was so bad and so serious or that you take this so seriously, I'm going to shape up. Maybe the, the therapist wants to negotiate, but maybe not. So those are determining um, factors also. Um, the notification is very important. Record keeping is important. Um, referral is very important. And our own support as we go through the process is important. Um, end of treatment or situational factors. I just had a long-term client, a DID patient with whom I was doing twice a week, very, very extensive work, whose husband is in the military, who has a very challenged life, and on top of everything else, he just got transferred to Midwest. And so her therapy stopped midway. And we've had to decide how to have contact, exactly what you were talking about, Lori, when, if to have contact, found a referral for her. Um, and I keep getting these days phone messages. This is now two months later. Phone messages and emails. I miss you. I trusted you. I have new therapists. Don't like talking to her. <laughs> no, I have to. No, you can't talk to me. Um, so I get these little Blackberry messages. And um, the first two weeks that she was gone, I did contact her. I did have interaction. And lately, I've just been tapering off. And that was by agreement. But sometimes those kinds of things are going to put an ending to a therapy that's un untimely. Um, and then the last category, can I have one more minute? <laughs> <laughs> unplanned and sudden. Um, and that's where the client may come in and say, that's it, it's over, I have no more money, um, or I'm in debt, horrible debt, and this is it, this is the first thing to go. Or I once had a case of a woman I worked with for eight years who just disappeared, as Lori was saying, but it was not as nice as your disappearance. And when I followed up with her, she just blasted me for how ineffective her therapy had been and she was under the influence of a lawyer boyfriend, new lawyer boyfriend who convinced her that nothing had happened in our eight years. And these call, come under the category of unfinished business and lack of closure. And to the degree that you can, you get as much closure, you put it in your records. And for me, I know I had to close it for myself because the second case that I described, this woman who left and I had done a lot to support her, and I thought her therapy was effective. Um, when she blasted me, um, I took that very personally and painfully. Um, and then there's unplanned and sudden, um, where you might have a client death by suicide, homicide, major illness, aneurysm, whatever. Um, that involves a lot more shock 
also requires you to be spontaneous and to do a lot of planning and record keeping. Um, the issue of suicide, whether out, especially inpatient but outpatient, your records may immediately be confiscated and you may not be able to put anything else in your record because it has become a document, a court document. Secondly, you may be um, inhibited from disclosing or talking to anyone about the fact that a suicide occurred. Um, and that can be very taxing to the therapist. So you have to know what the, um, the regs are. And so, in summary, um, there are many compelling issues. I could talk about this, obviously, for a very long time. Uh, I didn't realize I had so much to say in 20 slides. Um, but the bottom line is to get information, seek support and consultation as you need it, um, be planful and not impulsive, keep ethics codes and risk management clearly in mind because all of these situations, um, well, the majority of them, I think, involve a lot of ethics and risk management. Thank you.